Yes. It doesn't matter a lot. It's fine. It's just if you do, yeah. you need to make sure you plug that back into there. Otherwise, it will hum. It's not a problem. Sorry, what was that? This one here. 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 This one Mainly because we needed a little bit better. Anywhere there is fine. Also, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got the invitation from the FBI, uh, for which we're very grateful. It will let us uh, do bigger events and uh, a little bit more hands on workshops uh, with time. And today is really about a uh, couple of themes. One is the uh, introduction of the technology that has been emerging and emerging, but we think it essentially emerged which is 3D printing, uh, and we have a combination of hands-on practitioners, a little bit of uh, politics, a little bit of controversy, and a little bit of education. But really, it's just to establish where we are in London with the scene, uh, what's in place, what we need to build, and what are the key um, controversies that we need to preempt before they eclipse us, as it usually happens. So on that one, we want to be anticipating and taking it head on, as opposed to waiting for it to happen, and then we have to worry about things like copyrights and so on and so forth. So we just want to take a little bit of a proactive approach to future, with the view that anticipation denotes intelligence. So let's anticipate. Uh, and we're very lucky to have some uh, a few very interesting people coming from far away. Uh, Edinburgh, represented by, by Marie. Ivan came from Fabrivan in uh, Brighton, uh, but hopefully he will be moving Fabrivan to London, so we'll talk about this shortly. Uh, and uh, we have Martin Stevens, who has kindly uh, come at the last minute to talk a little bit more about the education side of it, which is growing quite fast. Um, and uh, we're ready, yes, Alice? Okay, how long shall we go? Oh. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Someone time me. So, okay, uh, I'll time me. I apologize if you are taking that in the country. So, if you get any change tonight, you have to do a slightly bigger version of this talk session for a morning. So, I'm going to run away. So, if you want to ask me anything, just. Um, so I've got eight minutes. I'm going to quickly talk about using 3D printing for um, consumer facing goods. So, uh, I am a CEO of Mickey Lab, we're a startup. We are basically a year and a half old in terms of when we got our first bit of money. And then we put our product live, Mickey's doll line, last summer, uh, basically as a competent demo. Um, so, really, this is what we do we're building digital products that produce physical products. So, we've got an app and a website at the moment. 
the exact files that are used to create the characters in the app push to 3D printers, two types. Uh, that's a little desktop maker bot that costs about $2,000, and that's the BIOS SLS machine that prints in nylon that costs about $150,000 and up, so we don't overload yet. Uh, and we end up manufacturing dolls. Apple dolls. dolls. Uh, each one is unique, or it was until very, very recently. I'll maybe talk about that. But the point about th we, the reason we use 3D printing is because on each print run, we print completely individualized faces for each doll. So a kid or a collector or a parent or whatever can come along and make a doll for their child, and that doll is one of a kind. Um, the kids will spend hours doing this. So the other reason there's a capital T there is because we are an actual toy. So to be an actual toy, you need C certification, EN71 in Europe, which is toy safety certification. Then you need it in America, and then you need it in Asia, etc. Uh, and we got that this year in February, and we got the line mark of quality from the British Toy and Hobby Association. We just got a little recommendation in the UK retailers, and which frankly they were delighted by because we didn't even realise they knew what we were doing because we were in the shops. So it depends on the shops. Um, so I suppose you can sum up by saying it can be done. And that's the world's first 3D printed toy on the shelves as far as we're, well, it is. Uh, and this is very, very different to traditional manufacture. So traditional manufacture happens like this. You know what it looks like. Um, Monster High, for example, from Mattel, took four years from contact to on the shelf. Um, Lego Friends, about the same, and then was publicized with about $40 million worth of launch money. That's usually what happens. They build the product for ages shove a warehouse full of stuff and then spend an extraordinary amount of money getting people aware of the product. Um, there is basically no customization in traditional manufacture because it, you can't. I mean, when you make an injection molded product, you make the mold and then you run them off in millions. You can't individualize it, which you can with 3D printing. The way you, you get around that in traditional manufacture is like American Girl. It's taken them kind of 30 years to get this to this point that they can do it. But what they have is 40 different dolls you go in, they all look basically the same, and you go in and you choose the one that looks most like you. You don't really get to choose. So if you want curly hair and brown eyes, you've got three to choose from. If you go online, as you know, the kind of quality levels and customization levels and personalization levels go way up. So this is live clothing on Etsy, the likes of which you just never see in the mainstream stuff on the shelves. So we, um, we are developing our product live and in front of people, which is brilliant and painful at exactly the same time. Never good enough. I think it was, uh, who was it? Guy who did LinkedIn said, um, if you're not excruciatingly embarrassed by your product, then you've launched too late. And that definitely <laughs> applies to us. Um, but at the same time, the, the great thing about going live um, is you get immense feedback. So last summer, we, like I said, we had a competent demo. It was great, but it sort of worked and could make a bone white non toy safe 99 pound product. Early adopters turned up and started customizing and telling us, you know, showing us what you could do with the dolls. And we ran through um, all sorts of amazing experimentation. Like going first with something is fabulous and also, again, painful because you've got no one to learn from, so you just have to figure stuff out. Uh, if you go to Shapeways and you want something printed in nylon, you can have it white. Well, there is. Um, colors do exist, but it tends to be post-processed with dye. And when we were doing the dye work, you could get black, jet black, or red, like warrior red. And that wasn't obviously uh, our thing. So we discovered that you can make Caucasian by boiling the nylon in PG tips. Uh, you can make a kind of more yellowy version by doing it in onions. Uh, we tried blueberries, saffron, all sorts of weird stuff. We ended up using Dylon uh, uh, because we found a supplier who could, could produce Dylon. But we went live with light brown, medium brown, and dark brown. And as it turns out, the medium brown Dylon reacts to the nylon in some weird way to produce green. Uh, so we thought, well, that's rubbish, but let's put it up anyway and see what happens. But the great thing about live product development is you can see it on live and green. And as it turns out, you start an avatar with green, the conversion to a 
uh, skin colour of choice and then a finished avatar is higher than if you start with a pre-prescribed colour or very light. So it's kept to some degree. Um, we're building pretty much everything in London. The prints happen in London and Amsterdam. The only thing that's coming in from China is hair, synthetic hair, because the only place in the world that makes synthetic hair now is China. Um, literally all other places have just done that in China. I think in a couple of years we'll see more organic materials coming out, but we're slightly stuck with that, but the rest of it locally. Um, so this year we managed to get the skin colours out into an app in about March, and then we really started to see some characters really emerging. They all kind of look the same, but they're all just very white. Um, but when the colours turned up, they started really taking on personalities. And these are, these are our users just kind of making their own dolls. Um, and they're really taking them to some extremes. And again, teaching us that boots, false eyelashes, make great dolls. Eyelashes, really. One of our people goes down to boots once a week. Uh, Can you guys hear at the back? Or do you want a mic? Can you hear me? Do you want a mic? Um, mods have emerged. We had a lovely lady who lives somewhere around the Brick Lane area make some reactive cat ears for her doll by stuffing the head full of Arduinos and servos. And uh, so when she cut her hands, the doll's ears to look the sound. Yeah. And we had a lady who wanted round of her eyes and a fancy mouse, and she got her scalpel out and just carved it. Um, and we looked at that and went, that's really awesome. So we're going to build that into the next iteration of the sliders. Uh, and then in July, we went live in Selfridges. So, uh, you know, again, a great thing going from demo to Selfridges in a year flat. Um, but we're also using it as a learning experience. We both got Selfridges, <laughs> which just said, awesome, you, how does this work? We were like, don't know, let's see. So we set up a thing where um, the kids can come along and have a go, and then you would buy a product. Um, really, with retail, you need something on the shelf. Our product is on demand, and it's only printed when somebody buys something, so very, very little waste. But in this case, we did need something to show. So what we created was the non-fair characters from our upcoming game. Now, the female <coughs> dolls will you make your own. That's data. There's a lot that we still have to overcome, and that anybody who wants to work with this material and this system is going to have to overcome. It's still really expensive. I mean, the, the costs of making each individual doll are still high mainly because of the material cost. So the powder, the nylon powder, costs about 70 euros a kilo as compared to ABS, which is more like five. So you know the, the manufacturers are, are keeping that high for the moment. <coughs> and we're not going to get to 20 quid, not this year, not next year. Eventually, three or four years, yes, very um, possible. That, you want me to use this? Yeah, they want it um, at the back. Really the other thing is, is retailers have an expectation of margins. They want 50% usually. So your product has to have that built in and the bat outside it. So that's worth bearing in mind. And that just doesn't happen right now. Um, but we're working on it. So that's the sort of thing I'm seeing. It's, you know, this, this is the knowledge that collectively we're all going to figure out in the next couple of years. The brand building costs of fortune, as I mentioned, like a friend's 40 million. We obviously can't compete with that as a startup. But our plan from the beginning was that digital goods would produce physical goods. We've done it the other way around because everybody said we can't give you money until we can see that you make this good. So we make this good and then we get it. Um, we're up against a lot of hype. Let's see, not. We're up against a lot of hype. Uh, you will hear a lot about 3D printing. Um, this is the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, you all familiar with this? It's amazing. It's the same shape. And what Gartner do is they plop stuff along it every year and some stuff falls off. And Added on. So this was July 2012 when 3D printing was top of the hype cycle. Um, July 2013, they cleverly separated consumer 3D printing, so that's printing at home on your own machine, from enterprise, which is already into the slope of enlightenment. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, I'm on record as saying I think it's the 1998 3D printing. I think it's world changing. I feel the same way about 3D printing as I did when I first saw the web. In 96 and went, oh, it's going to do everything. Um, but it's early days, right? Very few companies doing it, few machines, few suppliers. It's, it's just like let's go boom times. Um, and when this stuff really takes off, this is a two to five year thing, is when a bunch of patents expire instead of two suppliers, there's 200. That's happened with the MakerBot style machines, there's now 500 of those. 
but with the powder base and the liquid base, it was still in the uh, handful of machines for land. Uh, and those darn materials come down, and at that point, we will have a global distributed manufacturing network. That's the way it's the digital version of that. And that's not what we have right now with China and traditional manufacturing systems. Uh, attention is gold dust. This is just a look. This is this is our solution to kind of how to get attention. We're making a game that we put 3D printers in. <laughs> it's a bit meta. Um, I'm sure there are other ways, but digital goods are produced physical goods that then talk back to digital is our ultimate goal. Although again, in years hence, that's my eight minutes. Hopefully, thank you very much. <laughs>
on the website in the forum. And so we have some uh, quite a few of the users there sharing away. I mean, they're posting the experiments they do, they're posting the clothes, they're sending each other leads that they've made, it's amazing. Um, but it is slightly behind the system, so you have to be fairly advanced to kind of get there. And uh, obviously, we haven't got a, we haven't got anything that would be really good for kids at that point because it's a forum and it's all text. So yeah, going forward, we're going to we're just about to hire somebody who's going to spend their entire time doing videos, how to use and and make up experiments and stop motion videos and stuff like that and put it on YouTube and they get. Huh? Is it only kids that buy it then? No, at the moment it's about 60% adults and 40% kids. Um, at the beginning it was more like 90-10. At the beginning it was more male, slightly 60-40 male, female, and now it's like 80-20 female, male. And at the beginning it was 10% American and the rest of the UK, and now it's 60% in the state. So it's really changing over time. Basically it's getting younger, and the, the more we put out, um, we should be attention because it's a toy. Uh, but yeah, we always want to be about kids getting their hands dirty, sharing, and taking part and sharing what they do with it. So it's definitely a growth area. That's great. You know, so you do I didn't set this up. <laughs> okay, there's I a question go. there. Oh, one, one, one more question. Last one. Can you just um, give it the mic? I'm just wondering how this um, fits in with. I, I, I can remember. I think it was the early 2000s when Super Dolphin was in the whole. Japanese sort of character dolls came and they were all limited editions and people wanted to buy that doll with those accessories, that kind of thing. This is almost almost the other way around. Yeah. But do you see any any comparisons with that, those kind of adult collectors and the way that um, no, definitely. I think one of the things that we want to build out is the narrative and the character based stuff. Because being able to customise a doll is great if you're happy with blank slate kind of stuff. But um, it's, I think, always better to have it within a kind of narrative and a character set. The the dolls you mentioned, we do these ball jointed dolls, are huge in Asia, and very much a collector's thing in the States. Um, and we're already seeing some people deep people come over and, and muck around and things. So that's really awesome. Um, I, I, I do think the narrative stuff, especially for kids, you want the world. So we're building up the Makey's world. The Makey's narrative is basically you can make the world yourself. Uh, and it's going to be about encouraging making, crafting, and printing, and doing, and painting, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. All right, folks, thanks. I'm really sorry I've got to go on. But enjoy the rest of the event. Guys, if you're tweeting, just tweet the hashtag is Cyber Salon, which is Cyber Salon without the E. <laughs> Normally it's with the E. But anyway. <laughs> Either way, with the E without the E, C Y B R S A L O N. It's actually with the E. It is actually, yes. <laughs> C Y B E S S A L O N. Yeah, that's how it is. It's just down here, Pretzi down here. Yeah. yeah it's um, what I wanted to do was really just talk about um, where we might be going and how we might be going there. <laughs> Um, rather than anything really specific. Um, I've, I've got a little space down in Brighton, which is a sort of a embryonic maker space, and I have a 3D printer and laser cutters and the like. And we're trying to give people hands-on experience um, of this, this tool and to work out how people want to use them. I, mean, I, you know, I, I started in the art, I was a by an art student um, who fell into the internet a long time ago. And it's always 
it's nice to get back to making people laugh. Um, I don't know what that is. Um, and um, we have a, a slogan at my little place, which is, um, why don't you turn off the internet and go and make something less boring instead? Um, because we think there's a a, um, a movement, but well, there is a movement to put to um, to make things. And we've spent the last 20 years or so building the incredible uh, global networks and technologies, and getting very used to them, taking them all for granted. And I rather like this um, bit that we're back to atoms. Now, um, the um, so I just wanted to um, talk about with reference to how the internet grew from nothing to everything um, over 20 years, and use that to reference the 3D printing environment, where I hear a lot of the same things that we heard at the beginning of the internet, which is, it doesn't really do anything, it's a bit of a toy, it's, it's silly, what would anyone want it one for anyway, no one's got one, no one knows how this stuff works. And um, I wanted to suggest that um, we would go through the same process um, in the next few years, and that there are a lot of areas that need attention, and will get attention. Really, I've been watching this space for the last couple of years. I've been trying to find sort of ways into it and, and things to do in the space. And um, I think one of the, the main things is very apparent now that this is an idea. The idea of 3D printing is an idea that people like when they come across it. And when you get an idea like that, it, there's no hype. There's no hype. It's it's real. People are coming to this space and um, very determinedly looking for um, how to take this technology and uh, make something of it. Now, um, it's, uh, it's not a new technology. It's, um, the um, 3D fabrication, um, additive fabrication has been around for 25, 30 years, which gives us a couple of things, really. One is it, it, it is a reasonably mature high-end industry, which um, in industrial versions of a lot of 3D printers, and it means that a lot of uh, things that have been developed over the years are patented and, and controlled by affluent companies. Um, and then in the last few years, we've seen an explosion of very low-end um, developments, uh, which largely came from a guy down in Bristol you know, doing the RepRap project and saying, let's build, let's build our own printers, let's build our own printers. And that effectively comes from some technologies that have come out of patent and are available. I'm still waiting for um, for more um, some more processes to come out of patent. The more interesting, the, Alice was talking about how they produce dolls with a with a sintering of, of nylon by um, fusing nylon powder into 3D shapes, and that's really. That, those things are much more interesting than the um, deposition of hot plastic, which is what the little low-end printers use. But between all, the, all those um, types of machines, we're going to see something um, very interesting coming along. Um, so I was thinking about this space of how does the this little embryonic industry get from where it is now, which is a sort of a hobbyist or a little experimental um, plaything to something that is in everybody's lives. And, and the answer to a degree is we don't really know where this thing's going. And I think it would be a bit foolish to try and predict how this um, this technology is, is going to become universal because we couldn't predict the internet in the early days. We really didn't know what was going to happen and we can't predict this one. But it does have a certain momentum and it does have a certain um, elegance and beauty to it and, and it does have um, bunch of things going on. I was asking myself earlier which industries went sort of net native first in the, at the beginning of the internet and the beginning of the web. Which industries went over from the old ways of doing things to a completely online way of doing things and, um, and wasn't really something we expected but now we take for granted. In 3D printing, uh, for example, the production of um, hearing aid, the piece that goes in your ear, the hearing aid industry is entirely a 3D based industry already and in fact there's a whole industry of producing 3D printers for the hearing aid industry so not only is the industry um, gone to 3D printing but um, the, there's, a, there's a step back where the printers are produced and those sort of changes 
will just produce such a, a movement and a force of technology and people in the industry of education um, that we will see coming out. I'm just going to run quickly through the areas where I think there's everything to be invented. It, you know, all the all the smart kids really coming out of university, all the people who want to get involved in startup in creative technologies. I think there's a lot of spaces for them to work in because, quite frankly, there's so much focus on these little 3D printers and the blobs that they churn out. And these machines are actually bastards to work with. Um, but more than that, there's no interface to them. There's no, there's no pleasure. There's no networks. There's no energy. So um, um, it does tend to start with the printers, or everyone. That's where everyone, everyone gets their initial joy from. And then you see this machine, and it can produce a little plastic object in 3D, or the big machine, um, big objects with moving parts, multiple materials. Quite amazing. So we have to start with the um, the machines themselves, um, which sort of split between the very low end machines. Which you know, there's a Kickstarter project at the moment. Someone's producing a a resin-based 3D printer for $100. I mean, whether that's realistic or not, but it's an interesting development, it's interesting bit of technology. So you have a, a the low-end machines. You have the sort of prosumer machines coming along in the middle, which I think is where the all the interesting action will happen over the next few years. Um, at the show that, um, that Alice has gone to in Birmingham, TCT, um, now called TCT and Personalized, because I think they're trying to get the consumer end onto it. There's a company there from Denmark who have a, a plastic sintering machine, powder um, sintering machine, which costs 16,000 pounds. That's the sort of prosumer machine. That's the sort of mid-market, decent machine. Um, and my question to them is, why does it cost 16,000 pounds? What in your machine costs uh, 16,000 pounds for, for us to buy? We, we need to see that price come down to three, four, five thousand pounds before we see a sort of explosion of use. And then the professional high-end uh, machines, which, as Alice said, you know, anything from well, uh, fifty thousand pounds, hundred fifty thousand pounds, a million pounds for the very big um, um, sensory machines, which which are in use in aerospace and um, automotive and a lot of industries like that, but um, uh, are far, far away from. Any startup, any interesting use so far. So there's the machines, and then I think of the areas where um, there's so much interesting work to be done. And there's so much to come, and there's so much um, that we haven't seen yet. Um, input devices. Um, we, you have to get something. You have to create a model to print in 3D. Anna will show you something um, shortly um, in this space, but. Um, I think there's a lot, you know, you can go and invent things, you can invent hardware devices like scanners, uh, 3D mouse, things like that. There's a lot of software development, obviously, you know, all sorts of things will be invented. And there's a whole um, area of importing existing files, so the 2D, 3D um, scans, grabs, um, photographic images, converting them to 3D printing. And there's a lot of this stuff going on already, but there's sort of, um, oh, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> there's, um, um, Printer controls. This is um, a desperately horrible area if you're using a low-end printer. Even the printers that are supposed to be plug and play, they really do tend to rely on um, um, open source software. Really does again remind me of the early days of going online with, a, um, in, with an IP connection on the internet. Um, you have to use something that's really put together by people who totally understand the coding of the technology but never had a consumer view of the world um, in their mind. Um, the deliberate error there, um, net, network. So there are printers now coming that are networked that will, be, that will allow you to send files, um, a wireless, um, Bluetooth, um, but they, they're few and far between. Um, distributed controls. You know, we have a printer in our space, and it, it plugs into one PC. And if you want to send something to it, you want to print, you have to go sit at that PC and um, print, and it's a pain, and it's not something we're used to anymore, of those um, dedicated machines for um, We can do a lot more graphical input devices, do a lot more standardization of how we get our files and how we talk to our machines. And, uh, and what's going on. 
Um, I'm really interested in the ecosystem of 3D printing. I think there's there's a lot of stuff going on, but there's a lot of space here for um, and the networks around um, 3D printing. There's a whole thing with content. Um, you probably come across things like Thingiverse, um, stores of available uh, models for 3D printing that you can download. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space. Um, we need a lot of um, a development uh, of tools for developers and better users, tools for users, and um, distribution of both um, files and end products. And again, these things are embryonic. They are out there, but they are um, going to grow hugely. And then um, there are a bunch of issues that do also need to be addressed. Um, and we, we, we always get asked whether we print guns. Um, and um, I, I think the, the whole gun printing escapade, I mean, the, the V&A have acquired that defense distributed they tried to acquire the original, the first gun that they printed, the actual printed gun from the States, um, failing to get an export license for that um, actual gun for the, for the, from the States. For their exhibition, they printed their own version locally and have exhibited it. The guy who, um, who made it in the States refused to just put it in his pocket and bring it over on an airplane on the basis that he thought he'd get arrested on the way over. And I think that's a, just the encapsulates an incredible sort of um, a, a bunch of issues around that thing of you know it's a dangerous technology. A lot of people are scared of it, and a lot of people looking at it. Um, there's a whole set of IP issues around that. And Alice touched on this again. Can people steal what you've made and you know scan it and reproduce it? Is it a whole? Um, um, someone said, oh, we're waiting for our maps at the moment in 3D printing. You know, so we're going to go through that whole thing again. It's a lot of different issues, but there's um, a lot of stuff to be done in that space. There's a lot of development to be done in materials. It's a fascinating space. I mean, when you have the printers, um, Alice again was saying the materials are quite expensive, but also for the, the low end of the intermediate machines, a lot of development work needs to be done on a variety of materials, new kinds of materials. Um, you know, there are machines that will print multiple materials in, in single passes, and there are, there's a lot of development work going on, and it's going it's to be a lot of amazing tools to deploy in the next few years. And there's a whole issue of patents. Um, who owns what patents on what? And people are starting up little um, machine producing companies and then finding that the big companies just basically wrapped up a lot of the technology. Something um, we didn't really see in the past. Um, Alice said that she thought it was about 1998 in terms of um, 3D printing in relation to um, the internet. I sort of, sort of thought it was more 1994, 1995, because there's a lot of in interesting things coming down the pipes. We haven't really got started yet. Anyway, um, I'd like you know everyone to get to work and bring us the amazing tools for the, for the next generation. And uh, now we'll see you, um, Simon. From LBDI. Thanks. So another smooth changeover. <laughs> yeah. Actually, while someone's setting up, can I just ask you how many people actually are working actively in the space at the moment, either professionally or dubbing? And that. Okay, so few. So so it's more fact finding and developing your. Ideas. Uh, so, how many people are thinking about getting the printer within the next three months? Okay. So, are you looking more at sending, designing, and sending stuff to print people who are developing? Right. Okay. So, I think that's why that's where we are. Thank you. Right. Do you need sound? No, sound is no sound is required. Try and get this bit better picture. Right. Nice cross. It's better. Can you go in the back? <laughs> you might have to read a few little slides. Don't worry, it's very short, but uh, I've got to crash through this presentation. So, just as LBI, uh, welcome to our building. Love this floor. We've got four floors of uh, geeks, shall we say. Uh, we do a lot of internet stuff, so. 
um, kind of websites, and applications, social, content, marketing, advertising, design and build elements. If you use Formula One or Lloyds Bank, you're know, using a lot of work that we've done. Um, this presentation is about why sh we should get a 3D printer, boss, and that become clear. Sam, sorry, can I move you here? Okay. Bye. Our little kind of catchy little phrase is we are a global agency, marketing agency, technology that helps uh, businesses transform the digital age and actually that point of digital for us in many ways means screens. It's quite important point to come on to. Um, we talk about being what we are what's next, so trying to anticipate things for the future and helping our clients get there. So I want you to just kind of indulge myself for a few seconds, I have a bit of a maker story. I did industrial design and I spent a lot of weeks using one of these, that is a Harrison lathe. Uh, and I was searching for it, I also found this, and I actually spent a lot of time on that very model, not that particular exact one, but exactly the same model. I also spent a lot of time making models on a Miller. Uh, so much so I was known as Gil the Mill. Uh, we used to use Alias back in the day before it was even wafering on silicon graphics machines, and at best we might have done something as cool as this, it's a Finnish company. Uh, and it was interesting because actually what was appealing to me is the, the ability to use a computer to make things quicker and also rapid prototyping was really interesting for us. We used to talk a lot about stereo lithography to so much of an extent that when people started to talk about um, 3D printing, I was like, what's that? Even though I've been aware of it for quite a long time. And it, I, you know, 3D printing is a much better phrase, especially when you get your head around it. So look, that's enough about me. It's 2013 after all. Um, so this is Anil, he's our chief executive here in the UK, the boss man, and um, I have an imaginary conversation that I'm going to have with him about why we should have a 3D printer, which I hope you'll find interesting, perhaps entertaining. So we need a 3D printer, sounds great, why not? Uh, it's going to make cool things, you like what? And so we've seen a lot of kind of lo-fi heads, that people have kind of printed it in various exhibitions I've been to, that's not for everything. Um, we, could, we love unicorns, so we can have a unicorn when people array, arrive at reception, that could be personalised. The problem is that's quite a lot of unicorns and uh, how long will they take to print? A person will have left the building by the time they kind of uh, get the unicorn, so I mean, anything to get. And um, we have these little awards, we could kind of get personalised awards for everyone every month, which is great, that's quite an interesting approach. The boss likes that, but you know, wants to be more excited. So, you know, actually, we have used 3D printer before. Oh, really? Uh, do tell. And so this, this is the RGB, RGD toolkit. You download this uh, model on the uh, complex. It's uh, for those in industrial design background, so simple extrusion with some additional elements in there. And, and it allows you to uh, put connect controller and seat a, SLR, a digital SLR camera on top of it. And you feed them both into your laptop and it allows you to make films like this. So you're mashing it up, so it's a nice example of massive technologies. The model is free, we downloaded it, and then sent it off, it cost about 100 quid to make the model, so that was a good use of it. Um, an experiment, and you'll know a little bit more about how we could use it for our clients. Well, actually, yes, uh, I should do a similar project. So, um, don't tell me it's another camera phone holder. I'm um, slightly disappointed is that it's a camera phone holder, but it's with six camera phones. So this is a project with Sony Xperia, and he had six phones, they went into a spinning 360 jig, and then the chap then wrote down a kind of mountain, and he captured all that footage, and then you could actually look at the footage in a number of different ways. So that's a kind of practical, if you like, for us, commercial exploitation of 3D printing. So how does he respond to that? You know, that was good. So we could also use it for digital campaigns. Uh, VPH did this uh, cool thing for Christmas, obvious gag around 3D printers must not just be for Christmas. Uh, I don't know how many people have seen this, anyone seen this piece of work? And so BBH Labs did this, and the URL's down the bottom. And they were asking people to donate, and they would pick at random and certain people, and they would kind of find their property on Google Maps, on Street View. They would quickly model it, and then they would do a 3D uh, model of it, and then they would make a little snow globe. They would send you the slow globe. It's a nice, actually, example of using 3D printing, especially in our kind of world of digital marketing. And it's a good way of joining that kind of online and offline world together. So I like that. Um, Ace, I've always got the, my local block of flats, uh, but actually a lot of what we do is about innovation in the service design space, so what about that? Um, yeah, good point. Um, we work with Honda, so you could have maybe some personalised cars, or as one of our uh, technologists suggested, you could print out your own model engine, 
But actually, this nice little um, illustration here, the cutaways, that's what we used to do at the university before the 3D modeling came along. Um, that's a great example of actually being to print some of those things, and uh, you can start to kind of understand about how this might be used for our clients to experiment. Um, but also, this idea of replacement parts, I think that I'm quite interested in things expiring and then not being able to get them. So we could actually start to make uh, certain things available for our clients. So instead of them having uh, a big warehouse, they could just uh, outsource their designs and people could uh, make them. That was some things I could suggest back to Neil. OK, I get it, but you know, that's about not very future facing, is it? Now, how can we really help change our clients' businesses? Um, try to be more creative. So, you know, when we do pitches, often we will actually prototype things on screen, so that's a mobile phone app, but that's kind of example, kind of a uh, website, etc. But, you know, what about physical products? So, one of the things that we actually have talked about, I haven't done, which is a, a criminal offence, obviously, is that uh, you can have your mobile phone that could communicate to an Arduino board, which then actually, through a piece of printed uh, uh, machinery, turns on and controls your coffee machine. And the, Benefit of that is it's great at actually demonstrating this concept of an internet thing without hacking the printer. And so that's a great way of augmenting like, existing devices. And you can imagine about how that uh, can be taken further uh, into a number of ways. So actually, from switching the mechanisms that you're doing, this kind of hacking prototyping, to actually the core structure to hold these things together, to you know, actually the thing or the enclosure itself. So you know, the internet things is something that's very exciting for us, but we're kind of thinking about what can those things be. You know? For us, it's very much about a split screen and Arduino board as a physical object. So, uh, what does anyone think about this? Well, first of all, idea hackers. Anyone uh, can look to this site? A few nods. But this is, I think, an, quite an interesting approach that when you have clients and we're dealing with their like, digital channels, is to kind of start to bring in the idea of having physical downloadable models and like, additional hacks that you can start to kind of layer on top of the things that they're doing. Um, so, you can imagine that it now comes with printable models. Uh, and I think that is pretty exciting for a lot of the clients that we've got. Um, he likes it, it's good, but how can we st uh, push storytelling and data? Now, this is something that we talk a lot about, is how we can use data and the insights derived from that, that data to help tell better stories, whether that be in the product development, whether that's in a pro kind of promotional piece, or whether that's actually kind of helping create new content. So uh, I like this, very kind of interested in this kind of approach. Um, there's this cut form wind model. Now, what does that mean? Well, for those of you who went to the Power of Making exhibition, anyone went to go to that at the BNN a few years ago, very interesting, is that this piece here, and I, there's lots of fantastic things there, but this bit, the bit that really stuck out to me, it is a relatively traditional vase that was modeled in 3D, and then they actually ran digital wind over it. So they put it through a wind simulation engine, and so they created quite a random shape that just couldn't be made. And actually what's cool about that is that then through 3D printing it allows you to realize uh, a very interesting form that you perhaps wouldn't have been able to create. And this idea of kind of glitches or using data to augment and deform I think is very powerful. So I don't know if anyone's using robot robotify me. This is my one. I'm not quite sure what missing arm means. Obviously you need to tweet a bit more. But you can imagine a simple extension from it being a 2D model to actually kind of a downloadable 3D model that you can kind of print and experiment with. Um, other examples, this is from a project with the universe, everything where they're taking kind of data from various elements and then kind of helping them generate into these kind of quite interesting shapes, and I think that's got a long way to go. And this is kind of uh, the artist who is taking with, like, these two different pro approaches together, and so you're taking some of the standard objects and then kind of uh, munching them with data elements and then also using the data-driven elements around texture and colour to augment this further, and I think that's quite an interesting and exciting piece. I think that's, you know, it's got sort of a lot of artistic merit commercially to merit to be seen, but it's an interesting way of having these data-driven forms. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we could model our turnover and uh, margin each month, and the idea being there is that we have little characters that represent the, the quality and the health of our clients based on the number of parameters, and we could actually start to model well, our client's businesses as a character, and that could change over the year. We could kind of see it's how it's happening. Maybe if it loses its head, that's an obvious uh, position to stop. Um, we used to use my, the length of my beard, but that was a bit boring. Yes, that is an in joke. Uh, <coughs> but Anil actually is bang up for this in terms of innovation. And uh, you know, we have a surface table, and there's quite a few long things wrong with that uh, picture if you look closely. And um, it's an interesting point actually around innovation. Um, the service table is supposed to be the future, and in many ways it's been usurped by kind of simple devices like the tablet. Um, 
or his fellow LT, but uh, so he's quite angry about that point, I shouldn't have mentioned it, but so uh, right, we'll get one. And he's going, yes, just tell me how much it costs. Uh, yeah, we'll do. And this is obviously a quite interesting point. I think emotionally you start to think about almost get 3D printed, but the reasons that we've heard from Ivan actually is at what level do you pitch it? And this is obviously, you know, something to learn about and understand why you would do it once a business model. But I started to think actually it's rather like a 2D printer for me in the simplistic way. Is it what's the size of print required? That has quite a big, dictates quite a lot of this. What's the material you're going to print with? Uh, there's lots of different qualities, the ability to use one type or the different types. Uh, what's the finish you want and what's the speed? So actually in many ways a lot of the key attributes you would choose when a 2D printer still apply to this. I still know, don't know which one, but you know, maybe you can uh, kind of give us some tips. Um, but seriously, uh, that was a conversation. Some observations from this process is that I never ever thought about what I could make with a lathe and a miller. I just made things. It was a tool, and new tools bring lots of new poss possibilities, and that's, that's what we've heard, and I think that's very much the mindset we need to adopt. The act of making physical items is a driver here, not and the justification. I think it opens up lots of fantastic uh, possibilities, and I think that the process we went through is slightly inane, yes, but actually it's about physically and mentally kind of getting into what 3D printing means for you. And actually, if we did have a 3D printer, I'm sure it would drive off some opportunities and we would start to think about how we could use it very much in that kind of prototyping phase. Because you know the core idea is very much about experimentation. You know, data I think implies uh, a really interesting point about that. We saw the earlier examples of mashing up kind of digital, internet-driven data and input into the object and feeding that back out onto the internet. And uh, the thing around architecture. So a lot of the noise around Zaha did and the whole thing around parameterism. I think in this example it means that you know it's not just something that an architect can kind of start to get excited with. Actually, I think that kind of is something that probably we should a lot of creatives should really start to embrace and actually kind of move forward. So that is my presentation. I think this is famous quote. The detail on Wikipedia about it, it was obviously not the Charles Darwin's uh, relation. Um, and it's often misquoted, but I think the point being around 3D printers is you, know, you could kind of make it very analogous to how we've been thinking about computers. And so I actually very much kind of support the idea of getting a 3D printer. I've got a few people from my great department over there, which I know a lot of you need to get one. So hopefully you found that a slightly entertaining or interesting kind of viewpoint about why and how we're thinking about why we should have a 3D printer. Um, if you want to tell me which one to get or you've got a better business case, I'm very grateful to hear it. So I'm going to hand you back over to the experts. Thank you very much. I just wanted to tell you one thing to, uh, to sum up where we are with the 3D printing. Uh, we just came back from Barcelona, uh, where we were on a Viki conference, and uh, one thing that uh, I obviously wanted to find out is what's happening with the 3D printing in Barcelona, because they're kind of 3D people. So uh, we brought it up to the studio, which is they developed, uh, they used for including Sagrada Familia. Sagrada Familia, as you know, has been somehow unfinished by Gaudi, we sort of got halfway there and didn't mind it. And now they have this big project trying to resurrect uh, and complete. And the current day of completion uh, with technologies that we have is 2028. But because they have this 3D printing studio, the architects concluded that actually they will be done probably in half the time because it's just making it so much faster. Because you constantly can prototype and prototype and improve. And they estimation that you probably save them around 30% of the budget. So, okay, this is very top end stuff, but I think it's just made us all think how being able to prototype really cheaply and really quickly completely changes the economics of production. Uh, and these are people who were to prototype for many years, but they're just saying that it's quicker. So, if you think about making stuff, it's the speed, not just the printers. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. I'm CEO of Anarchic 3D. Um, I'm just going to give you also a little bit of background about myself and uh, my company. Just the main thing to look at. Oh, the main thing to look at is 
to 3D print, you need 3D digital data. And that's really where my company comes in. This is my background. Um, I'm a stranger to jeweler, metal worker. And I used laser cutting initially and so got into 2D CAD. It was fine with 2D CAD. I could sort of just about manage it. I found it did drain the, sort of the creative juices a bit. My problem came when I got into 3D CAD. And I really, I just so struggled with it. In fact, I, you could say I hated it. Um, that's, that's, a, that's the sort of things that I was producing with um, software like uh, True Space and so on. Uh, for you lot who maybe don't understand the concept of 3D printing, I hope this is just one or two of you. Uh, just briefly, take a digital model and it gets bacon sliced. And then you have all these different ways then of actually building back up those slices, whether it's extrusion, whether it's resin set, um, or whether it's um, um, sort of a granular type material that is sintered, always glued together. Um, I went into becoming um, a, a research fellow to look at a better way for people like myself to design makers to work in 3D. And we had come across um, haptic technology. Haptic means touch. Um, so that's what we were doing. We were investigating haptic technology as a more intuitive way that we could actually work in 3D. Uh, we then spun a company out of that, uh, that research. Uh, at that time, um, this, the, 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 the cost of our system, the haptic device, I think was about 12K. Uh, we were also using stereo vision, and so you know, the whole system probably cost about 17K. No, yeah. So that makes that myself can afford it. So initially, we sort of did bespoke work for big companies like um, BMW. But, 2008 2011, we started actually building our own um, our own brand model, and we'd come across a haptic device. This one here, this one here, it's called a Falcon. Um, so much cheaper. Uh, we get it into this country for about uh, 300 pounds. It's actually built for the gaming industry for uh, first-person shooters. Um, and we sort of uh, started then sort of building up our market, uh, testing. Uh, we actually had a small crowdfunding project right at the beginning um, to actually get feedback from our users to see what they liked and what they didn't like. Um, and then we also um, started working with, with Martin Stevens. And he actually put the, our system up for the Educational uh, Better Award, which is a finalist. So thank you, Martin. Hey. Um, I think that 3D printing is actually so, so exciting. And I think this, you know, this last sort of um, few years has really been about 3D printers. Um, so I've picked out a couple of my most sort of real favorites here. Um, the top row is a chap called Marcus Kaiser. He took his... Um, I think it was built on a Ratman, a Rip Rap. Does anybody know? I think so. But it's got um, uh, solar panels, and what he's using is concentrated sunlight to center Sahara sand, 3D printed. I don't think that's amazing. And that bowl in the middle is um, one of the outcomes of that. And I, I just think that is just so beautiful. You know, to uh, drag this out to the uh, Sahara and start printing. Amazing. Um, on the left hand side is um, Unfold's uh, system that actually 3D prints in ceramics. So they're actually coming up with some really lovely forms, and that's an extrusion process. Of course, it suits clay very well. And on this side, this is very exciting as far as I'm concerned because um, this is using precious metal clay. Now, I, I did research on precious metal clay um, sometime in the 90s. Uh, it, is, it is like a clay, um, but it's got silver in it. 
and you form it and then you put it in a kiln at a particular temperature and you burn out the binder and you're left with, okay, it's scaled down, but you're um, probably 99% silver, so it's actually um, in a very, very, very high hallmark. And this machine, which has been developed by um, Esteban um, at Brunel, uh, extrudes the precious metal clay and silver, and you can then fire that, and you end up with a silver piece. So I, you know, I think that that is the way that I think the printers are going to go. It's just extraordinary inventors, um, entrepreneurs, developing these types of um, printers into something, into something extraordinary. Now also what designers are doing you know, using software is also absolutely extraordinary. So we've got Daniel Widry, who's um, one of the pieces that he worked with with Alice Van Hopen, who's um, a fashion designer. Um, we've also got Shapes in Play, who did um, these speakers, and the um, they, they actually sort of capture sound, and then they're using software to visualize that sound into form. So I think this, this one is heavy metal, the one I've got up here. And there's a guy called Jeffrey Mann who um, uses a scanner, so he's sort of scanning objects, and with this one, the the flash that you get back from the, the, the metal that the scanner captures, he has then actually printed all of that, 3D printed it all into this, um, a, a candelabra. Um, and then we've got uh, Lionel Dean, who's sort of using um, software, developed software, so that uh, you, you, you add in sort of parameters and it will actually print out and design something sort of slightly different each time. So this is the back of a chair um, that uh, he's sort of developed. And in the middle is Lynn McLaughlin, and she's sort of using Grasshopper and Rhino to, again, produce quite extraordinarily complex um, pieces that are then 3D printed. And then Michael Eden, again, he's using very standard software but it's the way that he's been actually developing that with clay, uh, you know, really being quite sort of inventive about um, the material side of things. Now the problem is, oh, I'm, I'm actually missing, missing some, some arrows and things. Okay. Oh, that's weird. So up the top, I think it's easy. Off to the left is boring, exciting on the right, and hard, down the bottom. And we think ours sits between easy and exciting. <laughs> and we think that things like Tinkercad and such probably sit at that junction of easy and boring. Now, I'm pleased to contradict me. I'm quite happy to do that. Um, there's other ones like Blender, SolidWorks, and so on, um, that are actually, I think, are on the hard side. That's because I am um, I'm, I'm an artist. I come from in some of a very different way of thinking to an engineer. So I can't cope with a lot of those uh, 3D modeling packages. And that's why, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm running this company, because I want to produce the software that I want to use. So this is our system. Um, I think it suits non-CAD people very well. but. Uh, it can also be used by designers in order to do um, some quick and dirty stuff as well. But it suits designer makers, creative people, people on the art side. Um, this little gadget, the, the Falcon Haptic device, is very robust. I'm going to schools. Um, I can't go through all this, I'm sure you can read it all. Um, but it's a very non complex interface that we're actually looking at. Um, so this is, this is the menu. You basically see what gets in one pop-up pop -up menu, and that is the things that you set up first, you know, your references. Um, and with this haptic device, because you, um, you're actually moving it in three dimensions, so, you know, the arm actually sort of moves. It's not only, you're not only moving it uh, in X, Y, and Z, you're also getting false feedback. So when your cursor touches, um, touches your, your model, you can actually feel it. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get this up live in a minute when I've done. 
This is one of the projects that we've been running, which has got an educational side to it. We brought in one designer who had never used digital and didn't know much about 3D modeling. And we basically supported her through um, this project we call it 3D Consequences, where we all do a design and then we swap. So the top line is the four of us, each doing a design, and then we've swapped and somebody else sort of produces um, the next the next row. So you can actually sort of see how dramatically it can change or how sort of how much it can stay the same. You know, with uh, sort of minor sort of tweaks and uh, changes. But it meant that somebody who was a newbie would actually get involved. In fact, hers was the most complicated. Hers is the, uh, she started off with the, you know, the shells and they were all linked together. She did cause us some problems, I will admit. But um, we certainly are focusing on professional designer makers. Um, and it, it, as I say, it can be used by you know, professional designers and so on. Um, and the, uh, the spot on my head is Larkin, who is a professional Dutch jeweler. So she's now beginning to 3D print a whole range of work. And Farah van der Waller, she's an, a, a jeweled award winner who used our software and with um, Rhino. And then, of course, education. Um, Martin is going to tell you uh, basically about um, how he's taken our system bundled with 3D printing and scanners actually into schools and been working with them. But we've had great fun with um, uh, you know, people coming in and having a go, trying our, our system. And um, OK, the first models you do are usually pretty ugly. But from then on, you know, it's like a pencil, isn't it? You know, the first thing to do with a pencil, often the doodles are pretty ugly. So I think that's um, more or less the end. But I'm going to do a little plug for my book, and also that we are um, crowdfunding. Um, and I, I have left some leaflets at the end there, uh, because we, uh, we, we do need quite a lot of support, whether it's just people tweeting or just getting the word out more. So I think we'll plug in this, and um, you can have a see what it's, uh, what it's like. Shout because I need two hands. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I'll hold the mic for you. I might, I might, I might need to. I think when it comes down, it's like, um, sorry about this one, which uh, one of you? Yeah, I'm going to sit from the start. Uh, this the, the thing that's in the background there is um, just why I test the Falcon with, um, you know, if it's troubled a little bit. It's worth always, you know, testing something. So there's our splash screen, and there's the cursor. I think what, what I'll do is um, I'll go into. Um, I'm, I'm just going to come out of the grid. Just switch the grid off. Um, I'm going to use a line just to show you how three-dimensional this is. So there's my cursor, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sort of pulling forward, and I'm going to push back again, and go up to the side, and up and down. Right? So we'll do it there. Then I'm going to rotate world. I'm going to set my rotation point. You can see I can actually bump into the lines. And I'm actually sort of touching, and I can sort of feel that vibration. So I set my rotation point, and then you can see how sort of three-dimensional that, um, that scribble is. And using this cursor, which is say the mouse, I can actually rotate very easily. I can rotate that whole world round. Can you just very briefly turn the mouse sideways so they can see that you're operating in three-dimensional space? Because from the back you can see what you're doing. It's too much more amazing than you think. That's going to be fun. Just bring it here a little bit. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Right. Can you see it? Yeah. Are you going to have a go later on? Yeah? <coughs> okay. What I'm, I'm going to do now is um, I'm just going to go and get myself uh, one of these. It's not so easy when you're at an angle. I don't know what that. It's also hitting the right one. Right, and I, I, I do like colour. I, um, I, I tend to work. This is a colour cube. So when I'm in it, the person changes, and I can actually change, uh, pick up on a colour that I want. So I'm going to do it bright so you can see. So there's my cube. Now, this, this is the haptic part, okay? I can actually bounce, and I can feel that. So, you know, there's there's a sort of really rubbery quality to it. What are you, what, sorry, what are you feeling? Is there a vibration coming through your fingertips? If, or? If, 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 if you had a sort of uh, a, a, a cube, a rubber cube, and you were just like pushing with your finger, so it's resistance. You'd still get in that sort of rubbery. And that's in, and that's translated through, through the space. Through here. But you're feeling it through your fingers on that board? My fingers on here, yes. Yes, you're getting force feedback on this. So that, um, if, you know, if I was pushing into this, you know, I can then sort of feel it suddenly give. So this is suddenly giving, um, you know, when, when it's off this. Did you say false feedback? Right? False feedback, yeah. So can you set it up to model different type of materials? Yes. Very I can. hard or very soft. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's, um, here you've got change stiffness bar, which um, if I put it way over to the, um, up to the right, um, we'll pop back again, will you? I dragged it back with them. Right. So now I've actually got something I can't even I can't even push into it. It's it's really hard. And this actually machine works really well for training dentists. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you can have, so if, if say I, I went for another object, so let's just pick up on that and I produce another one. Um, I'm gonna move it. So I press it and I move it and I can actually you'll see how sort of I can move it round. Now the default in this is actually serendipity, you know, because you can actually play and see where you actually. Ooh, no, yeah, that's no, oh, oh, no, that, oh, yeah, like that, right? Yeah, let's have a look at that. You know, it's that sort of thing about playing and exploring. Um, and of course, there's the undo button. You know, undo button's wonderful. Um, so there, I've got, you know, that is really sort of soft. So say if you're a dentist, that could be, you know, your gums, and this could be your tooth. You know, so you know, it's, it's really is you are getting that sort of um, strong force feedback. So um, again, sort of on, on, on the sort of the, the menu, so I've got scale here. Um, pick up on scale, so I can scale up and down just by pushing this backwards and forwards. And I am getting a read out of size. But if I press shift and hold that down, I can actually then dynamically change that. Into you know different different shapes and forms. And if I if I want to sort of keep it at something, I just let go. Um, I'm just going to get another another form. That's what I want to show you is uh, move that move, move my world over to that one. Um, if I go into deform, this this is what kids like. You know, I, I shan't take too long about this. This is what kids like, right? I can actually go inside that, right? And I can actually, <laughs> that. And then if I go click, it'll then stay there. Um, so you can then sort of start you know, playing around you know, with, um, with this form. And that one is that one's still hard. This, this one is sort of like marshmallow. So it's um, very quick and easy to learn to use because this is this is how we naturally work in an, an environment, you know, three-dimensionally, and um, we're actually tapping into some sort of classic knowledge about this. So it means that much quicker to learn than sort of a, a more traditional CAD package. The other thing is that we don't need a lot of the functionality that you need in CAD. Um, you know, we, we, we're not having to go into mass production. We're looking at this very much with that you know, 3D printing. So it means that people can. Um, Design something and then sort of get it 3D printed quite easily. So I think I'll leave it at that and uh, let Martin talk to you a bit more about the educational side.
behind this line anyway. But, um, it's just here. Okay, whilst um, the uh, technology is being dealt with, uh, I noticed that when Anne Marie was doing her presentation, some of you were, were laughing at the uh, what she was doing. That is nothing compared to the way that uh, young kids react when they try this for the first time. You see them sitting down and they've got a frown on their face because they're faced with something which is very new and they've never tried it before and it looks slightly weird. And we say this is a 3D mouse and they go, uh, and then they try it, they feel the force feedback, they get the, the kinesthetic, the, the physical sense of the object and their face changes into a broad grin almost every time. They love it. So um, I am going to, um, thank you, I'm going to talk to you uh, about a bit about um, myself, what I do, and particularly about the the relevance of 3D in in the school environment. But this is also a presentation that, uh, to some extent, I give uh, in schools, both to teachers and to kids. So it's to give them some idea also about the about the 3D environment, why this is important, why it's going to be even more important for them in the future. I'll give you a bit of background about myself first of all. My background has been in engineering for the, uh, the last um, few years. Um, and I, my initial degree was in English literature. So it was obvious that I wanted to go into engineering. <laughs> I stuck with it. Um, and I now know enough engineering so that when I talk to uh, professors and lecturers, they don't realize that I don't actually know what I'm talking about. It's very useful. My, I've got a day job, I've got a night job, and I've got another job that I try and fit in in between. Uh, the day job is uh, I run this company called um, It Is 3D, and that is not a 3D print company. We have our own 3D printer, but what we do is we bring 3D technologies into schools. We give kids the opportunity of learning how to design, how to be creative, how to be innovative how to be entrepreneurial. And the 3D printer comes right at the end. It is the, uh, the tool which allows them to turn their creative uh, instincts into a physical model. And they get just as much excitement out of the design part as they do out of the, the physical model, which they then show to their friends and their family and say, look what I've made. So as far as I'm concerned, in the education context, a 3D printer is a tool. It's a useful tool. It's an exciting tool. There's a lot of hype about it. And uh, Michael Gove recently said that he would like to see a 3D printer in every school. He doesn't really understand what he's talking about. But as far as I'm concerned, that's a great thing to say because it means that we're going to get more schools coming to us and saying, can we have one? And then we say, no, you can't, not unless you think about what comes before it. So that's my day job. Uh, my night job is I chair an organization which is the London and Southeast Region Manufacturing Alliance, or LASER for short. And we act on behalf of all manufacturers in the Southeast and help them to share best practice, to uh, think about what is important. And one of the things that is important to them is skills. So at the moment, we're working with them to get them engaging much more with schools and with kids so that children understand about the opportunities that exist for them in uh, a STEM world, science, technology, engineering, and maths, which most of them don't think about at all. The other job that I'm fitting in in the, in the crevices and the cracks, in 2014, starting on the 1st of March and lasting for eight weeks, here in East London is going to be the world's greatest festival of future technology. It's called Technopop. The techno bit is fairly obvious. Pop because it's going to be a pop-up exhibition. And it is going to pop up between uh, Westfield in Stratford and the Olympic Park. And it's going to coincide with the reopening of the Queen Elizabeth II Park around the Olympic Stadium, which uh, was uh, closed for the major part uh, since the Olympics. It's going to last eight weeks. The plan is to get 400,000 kids, teachers, and parents, and anybody else who's interested 
in and finding out about what the future is going to be like in, in, in terms of technology. Because of our involvement with 3D design and 3D printing, we've been asked to curate the 3D zone. And that is proving really exciting. I'll just tell you about one aspect of it that I'm trying to set up at the moment. I want there to be, during week two, and week two is especially around girls and getting more girls interested in technology, we want to have a, uh, a 3D printed fashion catwalk. I'm going to try and get Condé Nast or Vogue to help us to set this up. I want to have some of their high rollers sitting in the audience. I want to have kids and anybody else who's interested seeing this. And it's going to be 3D printed clothes. It's going to be intelligent fabrics, so clothes with electronics embedded. And if I can find some really uh, funky new textiles or fabrics, I'm going to include those as well. So that's just one idea of what is going to happen there. There are going to be opportunities for speakers. We've got a 250 um, person auditorium. There are going to be little pods for classroom activities so that companies or individuals can take a, a class of kids for half an hour or a whole day. And what we want is the kids to be doing things, making things, designing things, and coming out with something, which is perhaps where 3D printing comes in. So we want it to be really exciting and really uh, something really inspirational for them. If you want any further information about it, I'll give that information to Eva, and she'll circulate it. And uh, then if you want to perhaps partake, if you want to teach, if you want to do some continuous pro professional development, development for teachers, if you want to speak, if you want to exhibit, if you want to do anything else, come and talk to me, because we'd love to have you there. Right. So coming back to the, the core of uh, what I'm doing. So in schools, the benefits of 3D technologies are all around creation, about innovation, and about entrepreneurship. It is aimed, obviously, at the design and technology uh, part of the curriculum and the design and technology workshop. If it sits there and does nothing else, I would be really, really pissed off. This is a whole school activity. Anne-Marie talked about why she developed her um, anarchic 3D package. And it's because she did not get on with 3D CAD, computer-aided design, and nor do kids. If it's taught at all in schools, and it is taught in schools, it's generally at key stage four, which is uh, GCSE years, and it's taught within designer technology. But only a certain number of kids get on with it, and a lot don't. So all those kids who don't get on with it, who don't find it easy, who don't use it often enough, who don't do design and technology, who are too young but are learning design technology, or in primary schools and don't see it at all, or are doing other subjects and don't see it at all, we want all of those to be involved in this. Because we want kids coming out of school, knowing something about this technology, being creative, being innovative, and thinking about what do I want to do with my life, and learning something about it. They also, you'll see their soft skills for employment, employability skills. This, more than anything else, other than perhaps literacy and numeracy, is what is important to employers. They want uh, their future uh, employees to be able to, to work together in teams. They want them to be thinking about what is good for their job, what is good for the company. They want them to be able to stand up and do a presentation. They want lots of things which we can deliver with this technology. Motivation is probably the most important thing. I've mentioned the broad grin that comes across kids' faces when they try that. And we've had a kid as young as three years old using that. We've also had a kid as old as 89 using it. And they both managed to design something. And we've had a few people in the ages in between. It's about motivation. Kids get really excited. And that's what's important. That's what drives this. So it teaches creative skills. It also teaches technical and engineering skills. I've used the words STEM there, but actually I far prefer STEAM. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and maths. But what about the creativity? 
And in fact, if you are going to learn to become an engineer, your employer would much prefer it if you had creativity as well. And that's the A, arts. Um, S-T-C-A-M, or S-T-E-C-M didn't work quite as well, so we just use it. <laughs> so, going on, I've talked about this, that it should be used across the school. Now, design and technology, obviously, art and design, again, obviously, particularly if you're using creative software like Anne-Marie's. But pupils learn much better if they have physical objects with which to learn. So if you're learning uh, the sciences, you could create models of um, the solar system, of an atom. If you're doing geography, you can have a terrain map. If you're doing Latin, you can have a Roman coin printed. You can have a, a Roman shield, whatever. Having these objects, having these artifacts, makes learning much more interesting and reinforces the learning pro progress and process for kids. And that's why we have started not to talk to design and technology teachers. Actually, that's a lie. We do talk to them. But we are trying to talk to heads as well. So on Monday, our equipment is going into the headmasters conference because I want heads to think, as they do when they think about interacting with whiteboards or laptops or anything else to do with IT, this is what is important. So these are the um, employability skills, which I've mentioned. Um, and I've also talked about the, the benefits for the school, for, for the pupils. For the school, it's cost effective. The equipment is low cost. For themselves, so they learn by doing, and not by seeing somebody else do something with a large machine. Now, why is it important in a, a more global sense? Well, I'm one of those who believe that 3D is going to be a very important part of our future. So let's just quickly go through that. Um, house building, that's already happening at the moment. There are some companies uh, experimenting with and trying to build houses using very large 3D printers. We've already seen a bit about fashion. And if, if you come to Technopop, you'll see that on the catwalk. Shoes, another part of fashion. Music, there are many people using this for creating music instruments. Um, this, uh, I've lost some of the slides there, so I'll just talk very briefly through some of the others. One of the areas which I think is going to be the most exciting is in the medical field. There are already some dentists who are using 3D printing. So you go in, you get scanned, and once you've had a scan, um, you go away shopping for a couple of hours, you come back, and you'll find that you've got a 3D printed tooth or bridge or whatever it may be. In medicine, there are already surgeons who are scanning patients. Let's say they've got a damaged skull. They'll scan the skull. They will create a 3D printed titanium part for the bit that has to fit in where, it's, where there's a bit of skull missing. And because it's 3D printed, it will be exactly the right shape, the right size, and it will fit perfectly. Even more exciting, there are some people who are printing body parts, printing pieces of skin. So if you have a burn and you want to have a, um, a graft, you will print from the person's stem cells their own skin. So no rejection, and it will be the right color, the right shape, the right texture, everything. There are also people who are trying to print um, livers, kidneys, hearts, so very soon, there will be no vivisection, no testing on animals, no need for having to get a body part from somebody else. You will have your own body part made from your own stem cells. And that is actually happening. It will take, I think, five to 10 years before it is ready to roll out. And then it will take the FDA and others another 10 or 20 years to approve it. But it is happening. And I could go on and on and on. There are so many different areas, but I'm not allowed to. There are so many different areas where 3D printing is going to become a really important part of your lives and of all our kids' lives. So um, that's why I think it's really important that you find out about it and they find out about it. Thank you. Can I give you this? Is this on? Thank you. Um, 
I, I do have a concern that, um, although it's fantastic that there are so many tools that are democratizing digital design and um, making the, 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 the sort of look from creativity to object an easier journey. But I do wonder sometimes that if people haven't used traditional materials first, that somehow they're, they're missing out. And I think there's a danger that we get so obsessed with the digital that we forget about traditional craft techniques and skills. Because I found as a designer that the things that I wanted to make in 3D have, have come from that. And I'm just wondering whether there's something that we're in danger of losing. Totally agree with you. Um, being in a jeweler, I know just how important it is to have those uh, the skills to actually understand materials and processes. And I don't think that um, it should be separated. You know, I think that it's it is really important that we do have workshops in in schools where kids are strong young piece of wood, actually understanding what materials do, what real real materials do, because if you're then going to work digitally. You actually need to understand you know, what gravity is, you know, what um, what the constraints are within in real materials, because I think that's really how you design well is when you have that sort of knowledge, that tacit knowledge of materials and processes. So I am a huge advocate of people coming to digital, um, but maybe after they've already worked up their skills. Um, but you know, maybe it should, be, it should be in parallel. Thanks. Any any other questions? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We go there and then there. I'm just just following up from that that question. I mean, there's a, a a great discourse on this at the moment. Just sort of starting with. I think Richard Sennett's book, um, The Craftsman, that, that really highlights the fact that uh, making is thinking, and thinking is making, and those two things are in intractable. And so learning about the material world in which we live, its resistances and its limits is, is fundamental um, to understanding any design and making process. Um, the question I wanted to ask, though, which was touched upon a little bit by Eva earlier, which you um, talked about the economics of production is um, it's an open question because I think I'm new to this conversation but is, is there a conversation within the 3D um, printing world about the labor implications of uh, a world that is produced through machines rather than um, through the hands of human production which is uh, you know, global um, phenomenon obviously a global market um, this you know, half, half the world is employed in the physical making of things. What, what, what are the labor implications of the world being made by machines? That sounds a bit like a lullaby question, you know, an industrial revolution question. If, if the world is going to be as dramatically changed by 3D technology as the internet has affected our, our culture and social relations, is the same going to happen for 3D internet? Well, well, I mean, my quick response is. Then we already make things with machines and um, have done for a long time. And I, uh, I would suggest that um, things change, but they also stay very much the same. So I don't, I'm not convinced that um, there will be major changes at the root. I, um, I think the you raise a really interesting point because um, actually, I think that when you talk about 3D printing, there's a lot of conversation around and no, I'm just about technology in general. And actually, that um, I don't know if anyone's read that Jared Lanier book about um, the, what the yeah. envisage. And actually, the classic situation, a really good way to think about it if Google builds driverless vans, what do the guys who drive vans do? And actually, has um, a major impact on the middle class. And if you don't have a middle class, you don't actually really have an economy, you don't have economies we know it. So, people are you know, perhaps blaming the internet on this. And so, we uh, for me, it kind of actually touches on you know, like capitalism. So and that's not a conversation I want to have right now. And actually, I think that the, <laughs> back, the, background, the background to this is a very good question, actually. The background to this is, you know, technology is having an impact on our society in a way that we didn't um, perhaps envisage. And me and Ivan started web agencies in the 90s, and we didn't think about it like that at all. 
and it was all about a kind of better future, and we would talk about democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think that we have to, with really convincing, actually try and think about what it kind of gives back to us. And actually, I think if it can be more around being self-sufficient, um, cut down on you know, environmental impact, I think it's really important. But also understand about how things fit in a kind of wider ecosystem. So I think that the ability to be a natural crafts person and use natural materials is really important. And like what that teaches you, but use the 3D printing as part of a bigger picture. Um, but it does face an interesting challenge for us in our society about how things need to change. But it is, it's very, for me, I think there are, it's a really interesting question to debate. And there are lots of parameters to take on board about how it will affect our society and how we perceive what the economy is and you know, how we can do with it. But I think you know we heard sort of some of the really exciting advantages that 3D printing can provide. And I think that you know we naturally just want to embrace technology and what it can do for us. And I think that we should do that, but we should do it in a way which trying to understand the bigger picture. Again, um, interesting question. I think that. Google and driverless cars is going to have a far bigger impact on uh, the number of um, people who have that job. Foxconn, who make uh, the Apple uh, phones in China, they just ordered a million robots to replace all their workers. That's going to have a far more dramatic effect than 3D printing will have. Also, 3D printing gives uh, an opportunity um, for people to engage in their own environment in what they want to see and what they want to do for themselves or from a design point of view. And uh, I had a, a discussion with um, one guy who runs one of these uh, websites where you can just download or rather you can choose designers' parts, which will then be 3D printed. And his argument was um, people will only want to buy things made by competent designers. My take on this is that people will want to get involved in designing, and that even if they don't make things which are very nice, um, they're theirs. And I think we've got a, the, the maker movement as an example of the move away from the 20th century of uh, mass production and one size fits all. We're now coming to a stage where one size no longer needs to fit all. You can actually choose what you want to do and what you want to have. And we see this particularly now with kids, because they're, 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 they're our, um, our demographic, who want to start to make their own toys, who want to who say, well, I'd like such and such in my room, or I'd like to give a present to my friend which looks like this, and I want it to be my design, I don't want it to be, it to be somebody else's. And I think that's very healthy. And so maybe more and more people can get involved in the um, in the world, whether they do it as a, as a hobby, whether they do it as a profession, uh, it doesn't really matter from this point of view, but people can get involved in making the world to suit them rather than have to accept what other people choose for them. Okay, can we have one quick have you got a question here? Yeah, we can keep it quick. No, bless. Oh, sorry. Um, it's okay. I can take some more, it's okay. Okay, we can keep going apparently. I have to deal with Okay, uh, just a quick one, uh, more on the education side. Uh, you mentioned you're obviously trying to get schools involved. Um, and forgive me, the sort of design package of minerals looks rather utilitarian. And uh, are you exploring going down to an educational version of that software? I mean, say, if you're going to a primary school, you probably can switch to it. So it's not going to make things that they're going to choke on. Or equally, if you're going to a second school, it's like mine, you probably want something more so they can design shanks to stab each other with. But, uh, you know, are you, is that a road you're going down? Or are you just using one size fits all the design. Uh, in terms of design, the one size doesn't fit all, obviously. And we're looking at lots of uh, different uh, versions. So one thing that we're working on is that uh, I've mentioned, and I've already mentioned, 3D CAD is hard. But we are working with a, a design technology, uh, an ex-design technology teacher, who is producing some excellent curriculum material to make it a lot easier for a wider range of uh, pupils to engage. So that helps to broaden that. It doesn't cover everything, but it helps. Uh, another thing that we're working on is that um, a lot of young children, particularly, love Minecraft. And so we're, again, we're working with somebody who is uh, taking um, virtual models out of Minecraft, which the kids are designing for themselves, and being able to turn them into 3D printed models. 
So really, anything which helps children to get involved in this is um, uh, grist of the mill. And I don't care what it is, as long as it works for them, then they find it exciting and fun. Uh, Russell, you have it's, it's okay. I have somebody else. It's okay. Last question. Okay, last question. <laughs> if you can ask it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, it's cool. But she yeah. asked one before. Go on. No, it's okay. Uh, uh, I'll, I just want to ask you, it's related to some of the other questions about society, is um, has any of you thought of what is the effects that will have on the political economy and the economies of scale and institutions? Because um, it seems like it's quite it's quite profound um, that it, it could have. Uh, I, I know it's way off and it's hard to predict, but has anybody... You know, well, I mean, my first response is I'm hoping that Ava will now plan a cyber salon the political implications and it's a very big subject and there's, there's a lot of stuff swirling around. Yeah, the other last question. I, I think it's just very difficult to predict how something um, like 3D printing is, is actually going to affect um, you know, the whole political or economic sort of um, side of things. Um, you know, you, 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 can, you can think that you can predict, but you just don't know what because you cannot, at the moment anyway, as, as Anne-Marie said, uh, who knows what's going to come around the corner, but you cannot scale up 3D printing to be able to mass produce. So the advantages of 3D printing are to allow people to uh, personalize and create things which are uh, good for them in small quantities and small numbers. So there is not going to be a sea change in everything very fast. It's going to be incremental changes. But having said that, I think that the, the, the world will gradually change in ways that we can't really predict. And will we get to the stage one day where we can have a machine which will produce a cup of Earl Grey tea? I'm not sure. But NASA have um, asked uh, a company to look at a, a bioplotter, which is a, a form of 3D printer, which could take anything, whether it be uh, stem cells um, or other human um, ingredients and mix it with uh, mineral ingredients and take it on a spaceship to Mars so that everything you need when you get there can be produced on a 3D printer rather, rather than having to load the, uh, the spaceship with uh, things from Earth. So if the will is there, and the will is there I mean, uh, in some countries, not so much in the UK, but certainly in the States where they're putting a lot of money into 3D printing, um, things will happen which are um, which will change the status quo. And how uh, governments will react to that, goodness knows. But um, if production is going to start to come back from China, it's not because of 3D printing. It's more because of the fact that the wage rates in China are rising, and that uh, therefore it's becoming more cost effective to produce locally rather than to, uh, to do it overseas. Uh, I've got one question for Simon. Uh, I think where we are with the 2D, uh, I'm really hoping that we're not with the 3D where we were in 1999, 98 with the web, because that's just about when the web was really boring. It was perfectly fine between 94 to 98, and then it just got 
in the rush to the funding and VC and PE or whatever acronyms, it just got really decimated and taken away from people. Um, and those of us who remember, we remember that it was much more fun before the commercial companies showed up and stuck on it. Uh, but with the 3D printing, for me, it's a little bit of a question. Really, people mm -hmm. of your background, you must be thinking that this is Christmas come early, that that's what you were waiting for a long time because it plays to everything. So what's your feeling about it? Uh, I think, first of all, I think the evolution of the web in 98, you know, we talked about dot-com, dot-com boom, bust, so that was in many ways as a natural cycle of, of kind of innovation. And actually, if you look at the internet, we're still really probably in the second generation of internet technologies in a way. And actually, we've probably come to the end of the first bit of mobile. And I think what's exciting is about how we'll see that evolve in the future. And I think that we have to deal with some of the issues we're talking around, the kind of political, economic, and kind of social aspects of the internet and what that means to us and technology. Um, and it's interesting that's one of the quotes about how you know, it's, it's like 98. I hope it isn't boring, 3D printing. I think that someone was saying on the tweets, it's still a technology looking for a solution. And I think that it's easy to, in many ways, have that viewpoint. But actually, I think we've seen demonstrated tonight some fantastic examples of what you can do with it. You know, my presentation was really actually trying to be saying, look, you, it's something we should be experimenting with because actually it has some, I think, some big implications about you know, a business that talks about being digital and about considering what's next, and actually you should be considering those and what it kind of means you know, to help our clients. And also, I think, you know, future clients, I think a lot of potential businesses could kind of spring up from the, you know, what 3D printing brings to us. So I hope it isn't uh, about to kind of go through a kind of you know, a massive commercialization and a massive hemorrhage of cash and everyone saying, actually, oh, it's not like it used to be. But I do believe that a innovation has to go through these cycles. To, um, to kind of develop, you often hold that off misquoted phrase, but fail fast. I think that's part of it, uh, about understanding what you can and can't do and what's, you know, what it's best suited to and actually seeing how it fits alongside more traditional uh, you know, manufacturing processes, you know, which you know, is very much the case. So I think you know, I'm very positive about the future of 3D printing. And it's, uh, I think this idea of actually making more things and people understanding about making and the idea of being more individual and actually return to crafts. I think the kind of combination of you know, what we talk about digital technologies in terms of and connected digital to what the internet's about, I think it is very exciting about what can happen. I think it has to be commercialized in many ways because it needs to survive in that way. But I think that still people will kind of push it in unexpected uh, areas. So I'm, I'm very positive about this. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but hopefully it was more of a my opinion bit. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's a thought that occurred to me, and it comes from your analogy with the 2D printer. And you, know, you say, well, what size do you want? And what but I would say, actually, when you buy a 2D printer, you're not thinking about what you're going to print on it. You just know sort of what it does, and then all sorts of things that come out of that printer, things you never expected, the mundane things, the mind-blowing things, bits and pieces over the years, but it just can do that thing. And I think the main thing about 3D printing is you just have to get stuck in and start printing stuff. And it comes to my other main point, really, which is that these technologies, and like with the internet, it's not the thing, it's not what the internet could do. It was the, the effect it had on our thinking that it freed us to see the world in a different way with a whole load of possibilities. So suddenly, kabang, everything changed. With 3D printing, once you engage with it, and I said, what I tried to say earlier, as soon as people even hear that it exists and it's real, they suddenly engage this idea and it's unstoppable. And really, you should just buy a little 3D printer and you to make a few hundred quid and just start printing stuff. And you don't know what's going to come out of that machine, but weird stuff will come out of it. And it'll just change you. It just absolutely does. The moment you, the moment you start printing something, a little thrill goes through and you think, oh my god. Like, you know, my my genesis story of the internet always for me is when I first got a response from more than one person through a green phosphor screen in a science lab at Goldsmiths on an emailing list when people replied to my desperate plaintive email. And I just looked at the screen and I thought, oh my god, there's a place in there. There are people in there. I can do stuff 
in there. <laughs> it changed everything in one split second. It was a transformative moment. And it's like that with 3D printing. The moment you've created something in the screen, and then bloop, 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 it starts appearing in front of you. Oh my god. Well, can, where can I go with this? It's really happening. It's just amazing. So I'd say just dig in and go for it. It's pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> Uh, just to say, um, we haven't got a working uh, 3D printer here today, at least as far as I'm aware, have we? I don't know. But I have, uh, for those of you who uh, perhaps haven't seen uh, 3D printed parts, I've just brought a few parts along. Uh, they're sitting at the front here. Come and have a look, come and have a feel of them. Um, it's just to give you an idea of the, of the sort of things that can be done. It can be creative, it can be pra practical, it can be engineering. And that's another thing about the, the beauty of uh, uh, 3D printing, is that it is completely neutral. It is gender neutral, it is product neutral, it is uh, type neutral. So anything that you can design as a 3D model can be 3D printed, and that is anything. So give it a go. Um, I've bought a few things that um, I've got 3D printed metal, um, bronze, as well as titanium, I've got a titanium ring. Um, so I'll, I'll put some bits and pieces out as well. And I also did bring uh, some 3D printed ceramics. One, one piece of the top front of that. Okay. Cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. Fantastic panel. I think we learned quite a lot and more than we thought we would. So thank you for everybody. And so uh, if you want to have a little go at uh, the haptic uh, force feedback. To, to just get a feel how to just form an audience queue. Uh, and just to tell you, we're going to do another event on surveillance today in a month, which uh, Vessel is chairing. We've got Casper uh, uh, Bolden, uh, Privacy International, uh, and a few uh, upper parts of uh, privacy. So hope to see you back in a month. Time. Thank you very much. I'm not even just job designer. Oh my god, that's amazing. I don't need to happen. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not even going to have a sense. Why? I'm not even going to have a sense. Why? That must have been quite painful.